Okay, let's um, take a moment to pray and then we will start. Uh, could I request somebody to please uh, uh, lead us in prayer and then we can start. Okay, um, Prabhakar Rav, you want to pray? Yes, Pastor. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you. We acknowledge your holy name. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you for this wonderful moment. Uh, Father, lead us, guide us into this class so that each and every moment it shall turn into be a good exchange of knowledge and wisdom. I dedicate Pastor Ashish and all the students, fellow students, and your fellow friends. Um, give us a wonderful time ahead, Father, so that we can learn insights about the end times, Father, and we can be built up as your image, Father, so that we can be utilized as your kingdom builders. I dedicate each and every one and all glory and honor to your name. I ask this prayer in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay. So today, I think will be the final set of lectures uh, in this course. Uh, we have a little bit of ground to finish on the signs of the end times. Then uh, I'll just do a quick review and then we will uh, leave the time open for any kinds of questions on the subject. And with that we will wrap up. And uh, then the rest of April will be time for assignments. I will work on the assignments, put it out um, in the Google Classroom and as well as the e-learning platform. So April can be used uh, just to take, you know, work on the assignments. It's not going to be very difficult. Uh, just three assignments um, shouldn't take you more than maybe an hour or two hours to do it. Okay. But you can work through it at your pace. Um, so we were in this last section, we were talking about signs of the times. Our intent was uh, to try and understand, you know, how close are we uh, to the coming uh, of the Lord, to the return of, to the rapture of the church and the unfolding of or the fulfilling of the remaining prophecies that are in scripture concerning the end times. And of course, uh, we don't want to try to predict a date or put a, you know, a month and date or anything like that. But our intent is just to get a sense of, you know, how close are we? Uh, where are we um, in relation to uh, the fulfilling of the end time scripture? So just to get an idea. So what we did was we are just uh, enumerating various um, signs um, that kind of give us an indication of, you know, this is how close we are. And uh, uh, just a sense of how close we are. But again, it's not for us to uh, put a time, a year and a date uh, to this. So let us uh, quickly review what we have uh, covered so far. And then uh, we will go through a few more signs. So this is um, section five. We are looking at signs of the times. Uh, we talked about... Israel being formed as a nation, as a, as a milestone. You know, it's like the flag saying, the end starts now kind of thing. Or this is your final lap, you know, some, some indication like that. And uh, uh, that's important because, uh, you know, Jesus said one generation will see all the things fulfilled. All the end time prophecies, one generation will see it. So the question is, you know, are, are we the end time generation or are we at least close to uh, the generation that would see these things. Uh, we just try to do a little bit of calculation there. Again, it's not our attempt to uh, predict a year, but just to get a sense of where we are if we were to consider that one generation, what would be the timeline. And we are pretty close, somewhere you know, in, in this range. Um, Second sign is Jerusalem uh, being captured by Israel, Israel gaining possession, at least a part of it. And then Jerusalem becoming the center of conflict 
uh, for all kinds of reasons. Um, and, um, you know, even if you're looking at the news today, there are a few Arab nations, and these Arab nations are not very important. Uh, we are talking about, I mean, no, I would say they're not very, uh, okay, I shouldn't say they're not important, sorry. Uh, nations like the uh, UAE uh, uh, and uh, what are the others? A um, couple of two other nations. Um, who are now, you know, kind of building, make, uh, trying to keep uh, peaceful relationships with Israel. Um, and so that's happening right now while we are speaking. They are in Jerusalem. They are having, you know, conversations. The other Arab nations, especially Iran, Iraq, Palestinians, uh, are feel let down. Uh, you know, that there are some Arab nations neutralizing their relationships with Israel, meaning they're not no longer being hostile. But that's interesting to see uh, that we know Jerusalem is going to be a center of conflict. We are seeing some of these things happening. Where is all this going to lead? We, we have to see. We have to observe. Um, the Temple Mount being ready to be rebuilt, which uh, the temple re ready to be rebuilt is a very important um, a part of uh, end time Bible prophecy, the fulfillment of end time Bible prophecy, very important. Um, and uh, again, how it's going to happen, we will have to think about it or see, observe how that's going to unfold. Number four, uh, the possibility of a 10 region confederacy, whether, whether it's European Union or the NATO or some other alignment of 10 nations who were part of the former Ro Roman Empire along with, you know, there could be this mix of iron and clay, as we explained earlier. Um, and uh, that coming together is also a very interesting observation. Uh, the possibility of a global economic system and a global identification system, again, is is very significant, very significant, because that's part of Revelation 13. The alignment of Russia, China, Iran, and Turkey, you know, uh, to see how these nations uh, are aligning themselves because they are mentioned there in Ezekiel 38 and 39 and, uh, and seeing how all these nations aligning there in Revelation 16. When we talk about the kings of the East. Um, we, all the China is not mentioned by name, uh, we we uh, think you know Russia, China um, uh, are are these big nations uh, mentioned or referenced there in Ezekiel 38 and 39 and Revelation 16. So just looking at what's happening is an interesting uh, observation. Uh, peace talks with Israel on the plan to divide the land. Uh, uh, you know, so. Uh, Arab nations, for them, their plan for the Middle East is that the Palestinians should have their own land, the Palestinian state. Israel is not ready to do that. So no, we will not do it. So the Bible is telling us that at some point, this itself is going to become the reason why nations are going to be gathered together in the Valley of Jehoshaphat, that is the Battle of Armageddon. So this point about dividing up the land, in, and in fact, you know, right now, as we said, um, uh, uh, some Arab nations, you know, they want to have good relationships with Israel, but they are also, nonetheless, those nations still are asking for recognizing an independent Palestinian state which Israel will never say okay to, right? So even though they want to have, you know, somewhat peaceful relationships, uh, this is going to be what, as we would say, a bone of contention um, between those nations. Um, so, uh, and then of course, the control of Jerusalem and the Temple Mount is again, a point of conflict. Another important sign is the church coming to maturity, which we spoke about, and it's truly amazing. 
uh, to see what God has done and God is continuing to do in the church among people. Uh, don't worry too much about, like we said earlier, don't worry too much about the structure or the, uh, the, the system, but look at the people. Look at what's happening to the people. People are being changed. People are being built up. People are growing. People are maturing. So that's the beautiful thing um, that's happening in the church globally, everywhere. Uh, God, is, God is doing a wonderful work. Um, and number nine, this is where we uh, came to. Uh, the ninth sign is that the gospel is being preached to in all the world as a witness to all the nations you know and uh, this is again a very uh, powerful sign because we are living in a time where literally all over the world the message of Jesus Christ is being proclaimed in so many languages like never before never before now i understand that on one side there is the the you know, what we would say as the dead church, meaning the, you know, the, the, the just the buildings and the form without the power. But yet on the other hand, there is the dynamic church, the living, vibrant church, which is people who are bearing witness for Jesus in all walks of life. Uh, it's really amazing that, uh, you know, whether it's among the very poor or among the elite, the gospel is being preached and proclaimed. In all the nations, the gospel is reaching. So we're going to move forward from here, look at some of the other signs. And many of these are obvious in the sense that uh, we are, we, it's in, in many ways self-evident. Uh, we are, are observing these things happening. Uh, Jesus said that there will be people who will persecute us for his name's sake for his name's sake. So he says, you know, before all these things, they will lay their hands on you, persecute you, uh, bringing you up in their assemblies and prisons and uh, bringing you before kings and rulers for my name's sake. But it'll turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. So, you know, how should we view persecution? One of the things we should look at it uh, look at it is an opportunity for testimony. Right? But Jesus said, you know, uh, when all before all these things, that that means when when all these things are ready to unfold, be prepared for increased persecution that will take place because of Jesus' name. Right. So there will be increased persecution of the church that takes place as one of the signs. So, uh, and we're seeing that happen uh, around the world. Now, when we say persecution, uh, it doesn't always have to be physical and violent. Uh, that is part of it. But uh, the other aspect of it is being brought before people of authority uh, to give an account of what we believe. So there will be the prisons, the violent, but there will also be, you know, where the very faith, uh, the Christian faith is being challenged, attacked. Uh, those who uh, hold on to the Christian faith are being ridiculed, mocked, uh, looked at, uh, you know, in a very negative light. And that is also persecution. That is also an attack on people, on us for the name of Christ. So uh, you have both forms of persecution happening, whether it's the physical violence or it's the uh, uh, more uh, uh, aggression in thought, challenging uh, the truth we stand for and the truth we preach and proclaim. So both things are happening globally. So there's increased persecution of the church. Number 11 is deception. Uh, there a rise uh, in uh, spiritualism and false spirituality, something that's trying to take the place of faith in Christ. Jesus said it in, in Matthew 24. He said, be careful. Nobody should deceive you because 
there'll be many coming in my name saying, I am Christ and will deceive many. So that there, there, there are going to be many people who will claim I am the Christ. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to come and say, my name is Jesus Christ. No, but they're going to come and try to take the place of Christ in our lives. Yeah, so I am the Messiah. I am the one who's empowered by God to answer your, and uh, meet your needs and answer your questions. So the many will come. They'll come as though they've been sent by God. And they will deceive many. They will deceive many. So that's, you know... Uh, something to be very careful about so jesus spoke about it you know there are false prophets false christ uh, increase in spiritualism so uh, think about what the apostle paul wrote in first timothy 4 he said you know the holy spirit is speaking expressly that means that he's speaking emphatically and he's also speaking very clearly so the, there is no ambiguity to what the holy spirit is saying what is he saying that in the latter times some will depart from the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons so there's going to be an increase of uh, deception and uh, wrong uh, teaching which is going to actually cause which is actually demonic because the doctrines of demons and they're actually coming from evil spirits but it's going to be able to draw people away from the faith. Just imagine, they're going to depart from the faith. And this is going to happen. And, 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 and people are going to speak lies and hypocrisy. They won't think twice about uh, speaking lies. They're going to speak lies and hypocrisy and their conscience is going to be seared. I mean, they don't care. You know, they, 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 they're not even living by conscience. So, the Holy Spirit said very clearly through the Apostle Paul in the latter times, this is what's going to happen. Right? And so uh, you'll have a lot of these things going on. And uh, it's part of the signs of the times. Another interesting sign which the angel Gabriel gave to Daniel in Daniel chapter 12. You know, he said, Daniel, I want you to close up the words, seal the book. I mean, whatever, what I've, whatever visions I've shown you, put it all together, close it. Until the time of the end. It means until the end time. And then he gave a statement. He made a statement indicating what the end times will look like. He said in Daniel 12 verse 4, many will run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. So there are two things the angel said to Daniel people are going to run to and fro which, which is another way of saying people are going to be moving all over the world there's going to be uh, you know an explosion and travel people run to and fro travel is going to increase and also knowledge will increase there's going to be an explosion in knowledge so two things now if if we Look at the way things have been going. Right. We are not just seeing, you know, a slow, gradual, steady, you know, incremental increase in travel and knowledge. That's not what we are seeing. What we are seeing is uh, 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 it's 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 more than just being exponential it is knowledge is doubling every day it's almost right or i would say knowledge or information if you look at uh, uh you can look at these are dated articles 2018 and uh, i'm sure we can get more recent uh recent information uh, but if you look at you know uh, data data because basically uh, you know, it all starts with data. Then from data, you make sense of data, you get information and you get knowledge. And then from there, you know, if you process it further, you can come up with more uh, discoveries and it drives businesses and so on anyway. So think about this, that every two years, there's like a 90% a 
increase in data. And uh, by 2020, and again, this is dated information, you know, the 35 trillion gigabytes of newly created data. And then in 2025, there will be, you know, 175 zettabytes of data created around the world. And we're all contributing to this through our photographs, through stuff we post and write and release and all kinds of things. You know, this video is going, this, this classroom video is going to add to this data. It's, you know, we're recording it. It's going to go online and we would have added, you know, certain amount of bytes of data to this whole thing. So imagine, you know, every call and videos being produced. We're all contributing to this fulfillment of this prophecy that knowledge will increase, right? And uh, so what the angel told Daniel in Daniel chapter 12, is being fulfilled in such an amazing way, such an amazing way. Uh, you know, it's beyond an exponential, like I said, it's beyond an exponential increase year after year. It's, it's just huge increase every year. The, no, the knowledge that we, the information, the knowledge that we are uh, obtaining through, uh, through all the data that's being put out there. So this is happening uh, right in our day and time. It's being fulfilled. Some of the other things which, you know, uh, may not seem so important, but are nonetheless part of the signs that Jesus gave, uh, because these have been there all the time uh, for many, many decades. Um, for example, wars and rumors of wars. Yeah, we, you know, a nation has been going against nation, kingdom against kingdom. That has been an ongoing thing, but what we can expect is uh, a heightened increase of these just before um, the coming of the Lord for the church, the, the final the final countdown. So Jesus said, when you hear of wars and commotions, do not be terrified. These things must come to pass. And, but the end will not come immediately. I mean, these, these things are a build up to the end. They're, they're leading towards it. And what will happen? Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Right? So we are witnessing some of this. And it's true. You know, uh, it, it has been going on over many decades. But what we can expect to see is just a, a heightened increase of this. Same thing with the next, the next few signs are similar. Um, fear, hate, terror, and despair. Jesus said, and on the earth, there'll be distress of nations with perplexity and men's hearts failing them from fear. So what are we going to see? Uh, nations are going to be in distress. It's like, we don't know what to do. We are at the end of ourselves. No, this is talking about nations. Uh, there's going to be despair. There's going to be hopelessness. And then also, people are going to uh, fail or give up out of fear. Right? So that's also going to happen. Right? Uh, there's going to be fear, and there will be hate, terror, and despair among the nations. He also spoke about uh, weather and geophysical conditions. He talked about great earthquakes. And, uh, you know, I, I've just broken this out into two, two points, but um, it, is, it is given in one verse. He talked about great earthquakes. He also talked about uh, famines and pestilences, which is our next point, our famines and epidemics. And then he also said, great signs from heaven. So things are going to happen in the weather and other uh, in the atmosphere around the earth, atmospheric conditions. And there are also going to be famines and pestilences, that is plagues, pestilences, and so on. So uh, I know that, you know, 
these things have been happening on a, you know throughout time. It's not something new. But what we what I want to say is that these things will increase uh, as we get closer and closer to the day of the Lord, right? And uh, the moral condition of man. Number 17, lawlessness will abound. The love of many will grow cold. You know, uh, people will be cold hearted. Second uh, Timothy chapter three, Paul says, you know, people be lovers of themselves more than lovers of God. They'll be hateful. They will, it's almost like they have no more feelings in the way they relate to one another. So the, the very moral condition of man will get worse and worse uh, as we get closer to the time of the Lord. And we can see that. We can see it. Uh, we don't necessarily need to spell out everything, but we can see these things happening. Uh, you know, uh, people becoming more and more depraved and hard and cold. Uh, in, 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 in how they treat each other. It's happening before our eyes. So these are all the signs uh, you know, that we could enumerate or put down and say, look, these are things that the Lord has spoken. Uh, the first set, the first half uh, are, are definitely things that could never have happened before. They happened just in our day and time. And then there is the other half, which is like from 10 to about 17, uh, the last seven signs, which have always been there. But what I would say is that they, 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 they be, they're increasing in their intensity uh, as we approach uh, the, the final period of time, the, 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 the tribulation and so on. So, you know, in the 17 signs, you have about 10 of them which are definitely things that can only happen, could have happened only in the last 32, you know, or last 50 years. And then you have another seven, which have always been there, but the intensity, the magnitude of those things are, you, we can expect them to get, to increase and so on. So, we are literally in the final countdown, and it's for each of us, you know, to uh, to live in a state of readiness uh, for the coming of the Lord and uh, stay pure, stay holy, stay ready for Jesus. Of course, we uh, must be busy uh, going about doing what God has called us to do. And I, I just want to close here with this thought that, you know, we need to plan as though to plan and to think uh, as though we are going to live out the full course of our lives, but we need to live as the Lord, the Lord is coming right now, this moment, right? So how do you plan? How do you live? You plan and you think as though you're going to live out the full course of your life because we don't know when the Lord is coming. So you plan, you prepare yourself as though you're going to live out the full course of your life. That's the way you plan and prepare yourself. But you live moment by moment as though the Lord is coming right now. Right? That means every moment I'm ready. If he comes now, I'm ready to go. No regrets, nothing unfinished in the sense of, you know, I'm ready. But we plan, we think as though we're going to live out the full course of our lives. And that's how we um, journey through every day. So that's a you know, a, a, a happy uh, paradox. It seems like opposite, but that's how we got to live our lives in a state of readiness. Uh, let me take some questions and then uh, we will do a quick uh, a review of uh, all that we've gone through uh, in this course. Just, just, a, just a quick run through. I'm not going to go into all the details because you've already heard all the details but uh, we'll just do a quick review of things. Um, any questions that we want to talk about before we get into? Okay. All right, so I'm looking at the chat. 
Um, Christopher says anti-conversion laws. Yeah, that's an increased, uh, at least for us in India, we are seeing that definitely uh, 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 a veiled um, attack on on the church as well. Elisha's question, how should the church respond to these signs, example, for false teaching and deceptions? Should the church be onlookers, as they say, as they are signs of the end times, or should we do something about it? So, good question, Elisha. So the Bible tells us that the church, this is 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse uh, 15. Um, the Bible tells us that we are the pillar and ground of truth. The church is the pillar and ground of truth. I just want to make sure it's First Timothy, yeah, First Timothy 3, uh, 15. Right? So First Timothy 3, 15, be the church, uh, uh, are the pillar and ground of truth. I mean, the church is to be the upholder and the foundation, the mainstay of truth in our world. So how do we fight what is false? The best way to fight what is false is by amplifying the truth. Um, so what is the church's responsibility? Keep proclaiming the truth. Keep amplifying the truth. So we shouldn't waste our time pinpointing what is false because there'll be all variations of false, falsehood and falsity coming. We can't waste our time on pinpointing the false. What we should do is amplifying the truth, keep amplifying the truth, because when people get to know the truth, they will recognize what is false. Right? So we not we don't fight the truth by highlighting. We don't sorry. We don't fight the false by highlighting the false. We fight the false by highlighting the truth. So that's the response to the church. Keep amplifying the truth, making the truth clearer, brighter, and better so that people can see it and understand it, then they know how, what is, you know, they will be able to identify what's false and stay away from it. Thank you very much, Basta. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, everybody's with us in the end, at the end times. We've gone through the signs. Any questions? Okay. Let me just run through a quick review of things, and then maybe that might trigger some questions. Um, so let me just go ahead and share the screen. This, this is just a quick review, okay? Um, so that... Uh, it might trigger, okay. So I'm just going through the Word document, not the PDF. Um, so basically what we did was uh, we um, uh, looked at the fact that the Bible is a prophetic book. Uh, we talked about a little bit about geog geogra geography or history and geography. So the Middle East and other regions and then the geography, Israel and its neighbors. Uh, and then we went through a panoramic view of uh, things that would happen. And then the fifth section was um, the signs of the times. Okay. So when we started in the introduction, we just, uh, you know, we went through some uh, points as to why it's important to study about the end times. So we uh, listed out, you know, some reasons why end times and, uh, is important. We also, let me make it a little bigger, maybe. Uh, we also, um, discussed uh, some of the key, uh, you know, uh, guidelines that we follow when we study the end times, uh, so that uh, we interpret scripture uh, with these guidelines. So we explained uh, some of our, some of those points there. Then uh, we started off in our first section that the Bible is a prophetic book. There are many prophecies in the Bible. We looked at some of them. Uh, that uh, were fulfilled, whether over hundreds of years or some even over thousands of years. Uh, some very detailed prophecies concerning Christ have been fulfilled and so on. And therefore, we say the Bible is a very reliable book. 
we also made mention that uh, there are you know uh, different terms terminologies used in relation to the end times like the 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 phrase latter times latter years latter days last day end time time of the end these are all used synonymously but uh, depending on the context it could be referencing different points along the end time calendar uh, we looked at uh, Matthew 24 um, where Jesus talked about the signs of the end times and we broke Matthew 24 into three sections uh, that would help us uh, understand what he was saying uh, and, and, and so we went through Matthew 24 and which is also a parallel to Luke 21. So these were the uh, uh, end time terminology we just listed out uh, these these key phrases in relation to the end times uh, that we find in scripture. So then we moved into looking at some geography and history concerning uh, uh, the Middle East and uh, Israel and its neighbors. We talked about how the land was promised to Abraham, how uh, the Arabs came and overtook uh, uh, almost all of the region around. Uh, uh, we made mention of uh, the Roman Empire that was there prior to that. Uh, this is of interest to us because uh, it, it forms a major part of Daniel's prophecies concerning the end times. Uh, and um, we will look at that in detail when we study Daniel next year. Um, so we made mention of these regions. And uh, we also made, you know, talked about how Russia is uh, referenced. Kings of the East could be China. Uh, and the region where the Battle of Armageddon will take place, the Jezreel Valley, just north, uh, the northern part of Israel, where things would, uh, uh, that would be the final battle. So we talked about uh, some of the points of conflict in and around Israel, uh, how this land was promised to the people, a little bit about their history. Um, this is a table that don't necessarily have to read, but uh, but just to know, and um, the areas of conflict, right? The West Bank and the Gaza Strip, where the Palestinians are occupied right now, Jerusalem and the uh, the Temple in Jerusalem being uh, big points of conflict. So we spoke a little bit about the Temple Mount uh, and uh, what has happened there. And uh, we also mentioned, uh, yeah, so that's just looking at pictures of the Temple Mount and the settlements that are happening uh, in those areas that are being points of conflict, right? And these are things that have been spoken of Israel, Egypt, and Syria in the days to come. Uh, yeah, so then we went through uh, a panoramic view of the end time events. So we said that uh, we are in the church age now. Next thing to happen is the rapture of the church. The church will be in heaven for a period of seven years. We talked about what will happen in heaven, the rewards, um, mansions, marriage supper, seven years of tribulation here on earth. Christ returns, the battle of Armageddon, and then a thousand year reign of Christ a great by throne judgment and new heavens and the new earth. So that's the chronology of the end times that we went through. Of course, uh, we had a little bit more detail as we went through uh, uh, Revelation. So basically what we said is Revelation chapters one, two, and three uh, is, is here at the start of the church age. Uh, Revelation four and five is a picture of what's happening in heaven right after the rapture of the church. Revelation chapter six through 19 is what's happening here on earth. Mostly we are looking at what's happening here on earth during the seven years of tribulation, Revelation 20. Uh, Revelation 19 ends with the battle of Armageddon and Revelation 20 uh, talks about this thousand year reign of Christ. Revelation 21 and 22 is the new heavens, and the new earth. So the book of Revelation kind of outlines this whole chronology uh, of events that will unfold. And so then we went into 
several details of uh, these things here. And the last chapter is what we covered today, which is uh, the uh, signs of the times. Uh, we went through, uh, you know, what are the signs indicating where we are. Okay. So let's see now. Okay, I see a question here from so see, children are turning away from God's word. What should we as parents do to bring them back to God? Uh, I can just share a few of my thoughts. Um, uh, he, you know, um, so one one of the things that we can see happening in in um, in the world, generally speaking, is um, knowledge has increased so much, and knowledge is accessible. So, you know, for example, if we go back in time 30 years, we never, you know, had smartphones. Uh, we never had access to information on the internet the way children do today. So for us, I mean, 30 years ago, our reference point or our, our, our learning, our medium of learning was very limited or the information that was being that we could access was very limited in the sense that it was either what we heard in school, heard at home, or maybe newspaper and television to that extent. Today, things are very different. Uh, children have access to all kinds of information, good and bad, uh, because of the internet and then the use of smartphones and computers. So information is constantly coming to them uh, so you can imagine, you know, 30 years ago, children would be taken to church, they would hear the word of God, they would be taught the things of God, and there wasn't any competing information, not much competing information to the truth that they were being told. Today, times are different. To every statement of truth, there could be 10 contradictory statements that are coming to the child from all kinds of sources online, through the internet, videos, celebrities, and it's all right there in their hands, right? So the, the, the information overload ha is impacting children and therefore is, you know, children are being, could be sway, swayed by any number of things. It's not that the truth we are saying is no longer the truth, no. The truth that the church is teaching or the parents are giving the children is still the truth. But the problem is to every statement of truth we are giving to the to our children, there are 10 untruths coming, to, you know, 10 or more untruths coming through all kinds of channels and media, uh, which are bombarding the minds of children. So we have to understand that they are going to go through this process, through this period of time where they're going to process this information. You know, 30 years ago, mom and dad would say, do what I say, and what I'm telling you is the right thing. And we didn't have an option, we just followed because there was no competing information. At the most, you know, there would be a textbook in school on whatever, that's, that's all. Today, the pastor preaches, the Sunday school teacher says something, parents say something, but children are also exposed to so much of other information. Now we can't stop it. We can't tell our children, you know, don't go online, don't use your phone, don't use your computer. They need it for, you know, all their work and activity and schoolwork and college work, etc. So it's there, they have to use it. The only thing now is it's going to take time for them to process all this information and arrive at their conclusion. And I feel that we should let them arrive at their conclusion. We can't do what was done 30 years ago where it says, you know, what I'm telling you is the truth, just follow me. No. Today, we've got to let people, okay, you want to examine the truth, feel free. You want to explore knowledge, feel free. 
you come to, you explore and you come to your conclusion. But we can't stop that, we can't prevent that from happening because information is there. So what can we do as parents? Well, I think the most important thing is the life we live, is the life we live. You know, uh, on Saturday, on Saturday, this past Saturday, we had a, our membership class. So, you know, we, we, we do membership class uh, every, every quarter for those who want to become members of the church. And I was just talking to the people. I was just listening and people were spontaneously of their own accord sharing why they were choosing to become members of the church. Why were they choosing? You know, they, they themselves were sharing. You know, I wasn't going and asking, why, why are you choosing to become a member of all people's church? I wasn't asking that. They were spontaneously sharing. And very interestingly, many of them were sharing. And there were similarities in what they were, they were saying. You know, we, are see, we see the lives the pastors living. I mean, not just me, but the, the leaders. You know, they're saying, we're seeing that. We love the simplicity. We love, and all of you are alike, and nobody's drawing attention to themselves. Nobody is creating an aura around a particular person. That's not what we're seeing here. We are seeing people who are just living simple lives. And, you know, so, and I was hearing this from different, you know, people. And so, you know, it just struck me. We are preaching sermons, you know, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and all of that. But what's really impacting people, and, and, and I'm sure the word of God is impacting people. And I'm sure the word of God is an important reason why people are coming to church. But beyond the word, what's standing out in their hearts and minds is the life that these people are living. You know, that's standing out. So what I want to share with us as parents also is that, you know, the biggest impact that, will, that we will have on our children is the life we live. If we model Christ, that will be a louder voice to them, uh, louder than all the knowledge and information that's coming to them, because we can't stop it. You know, at some point, they're going to go to college. At some point, they're going to, you know, they're going to be exposed to more and more information. We can't stop that, you know, uh, unless we send them to China or Russia. Sorry, I'm, I'm just joking there. But, okay, China and Russia, they would control information. But generally speaking, you know, knowledge is going to come to them. But what's what can be louder than knowledge and information? It's the life that we live. So I would say, you know, that is going to be the most powerful voice that echoes in the ears of the children. It's a life that we live before them as parents and as, you know, as church people, as, uh, as Christian leaders. Children are observing and that is going to impact them and that's going to pull them strongly towards God. Uh, that's a long answer to your question. I hope it helps to see. God bless. Thank you, Pastor. All right, uh, questions? Uh, I, I see Divya and uh, Shri Kumar. Let's take it. Divya? Thank you, thank you, Pastor. Uh, my question is from Isaiah 17, uh, and where it says in uh, verse 1, uh, an oracle concerning Damascus. See, Damascus will no longer be a city, what but will become a heap of ruins and it goes on to tell about uh mm. Damascus. so i uh has this happened like if i'm checking this uh like it's not it's still inhabited uh so is this something in the future or is it uh, uh like is it something that comes before uh, rapture or the uh, where does mm. it fit? Yeah, or has it already happened? Yeah. So um, some of Isaiah's prophecies. Uh, so uh, let me say, not all of Isaiah's prophecies are like about the end times. Those there are prophecies that are near term. That means uh, they 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 are they were to happen in that short period of time, meaning a couple of hundred years. Right. So uh, he prophesied against many 
cities and nations that were around Israel. So like here, and, and, and you know, of course, you refer to Damascus and Ethiopia and Egypt and so on. So these were near term prophecies, which were fulfilled in that day and time, uh, as we see the sequence of world empires that came in. So there was, um, you know, when you go back in time, of course, there was Egypt I mean, in that region, right? We're talking about around the Mediterranean, uh, there was Egypt. After Egypt came the uh, the, uh, of course, uh, Israel was, um, or the people, the Jewish people, they came out of Egypt, they occupied their land. Subsequently, were the Assyrians who came in, they dispersed, or they attacked Israel to some extent. But subsequent to the Assyrians were the Babylonians, or Nebuchadnezzar. They came, they dispersed the Jews. So the Babylonians came into power. But after the Babylonians came the Medes and the Persians who overthrew the Babylonians. Then came the Greeks. So in this process, uh, so the, the Medes and the Persians, so you can look at Babylonians, Medes and Persians who are from that region, right? From uh, 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 Iran, Iraq, Persia. But then came, after them came the Greeks. They came from the, the West and the Greeks overthrew these regions where the Babylonians and Medes and Persians. So Babylonians and Medes and Persians were basically from that region of what we know as Damascus, right? Which Damascus would be modern day Iraq uh, in that area. So the Babylonians and the Medes and the Persians, they were in that geography. That's where they had their capitals. But when the Greeks came, they overthrew them. So those were near-term prophecies that were fulfilled shortly after, you know, in a couple of hundred years after Isaiah. Okay, okay, Pastor. Thank yeah. you. Shrikumari, your question, please. Yeah, thank you, Pastor. Pastor, my question is from Romans chapter 2. And... Uh, and the Bible says here, Romans chapter 2, verse 2 onwards, now we know that God's judgment against those two, those two such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere man, pass judgment on them, they do the same thing. And uh, if you continue to read, and uh, when it comes to the 10th word onwards, um, but the glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, pass for the Jew, then for the Gentiles, for God does not show favoritism. Then the 12th word says, all who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. And, um, and indeed, when the Gentiles who do not have the law, do by nature required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. Since they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts now accusing now, even defending them. So my question is, um, is this that um, um, based on the scripture, when the God is going to judge the people, um, is he wants to say here that, um, can Gentile, it means Gentiles also, uh, because of uh, they fulfill the requirements of the law, they can also make heaven. They can also be accepted in the heaven. That's my question. If they are not believing on Jesus or mm. as per the as per this, because he says that God is not a God of favoritism, and um, and uh, and the tenth word says, but glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good. So what he wants to say? Thank you, Pastor. So the answer is in the 16th verse. The answer is in the 16th verse, where Paul says, in the day when God will judge the secrets of men's hearts by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. So how will people be judged, Jews and Gentiles? They'll be judged by Jesus Christ, according to the gospel. So 
uh, and we will study this. We will study Romans chapter two um, in our third year. We'll go verse by verse. But what Paul is explaining to us in chapter two is there are Jews and Gentiles and we are both standing before God as sinners. Uh, because you know he, he builds this whole understanding in chapter two. He makes it a point to say very clearly in verse 16 that everybody will be judged according to the gospel. And he continues that thought in chapter three, you know, and you can look at verse 10, verse 14, verse 23, it says, look, all, us, all of us have sinned. There is none righteous, not even one. So Jew and Gentile are standing before God as sinners. And there is only one hope. And then in Romans 3, he says in Romans 3.22, that we're all justified by faith through Christ. So starting in Romans 1, where he establishes the evidence of God and the sinfulness of man. Chapter 2, both Jew and Gentile stand condemned before God. The Jew, because he fails to keep the law. The Gentile, because he fails to live by the law of his conscience. And yet both, are, both stand condemned before God. The Jew cannot boast that he has the law because he's failed to keep the law. And uh, Jew and Gentile stand before God condemned. That is chapter 3. End of chapter 3, the only solution is salvation through Christ. Romans chapter 4, the only way you can experience that salvation is through faith. Romans chapter 5, God gives it to us as a free gift through grace. So it's a whole series of thought that he builds up. And it's so beautiful to study all of that. We'll do that in next year. Thank you. OK, so um, kinda, I was thinking of getting closing, but I see Avni's question. Jeremiah 31st chapter, Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 34. Yeah, so Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 33 and 34. Um, Jeremiah, so the Old Testament prophets prophesied about the new covenant. So Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 33 and 34. You also, uh, I think it's an also in Ezekiel 36, where Ezekiel prophesied, right? Um, uh, so that, that God will, uh, this is in Ezekiel 36, uh, verses 21 to 27. And this is quoted for us in Hebrews chapter 10. So basically, Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 36, are prophecies concerning the new covenant, which God has established. And then in Hebrews chapter uh, chapter 10, I think it is. Uh, let me see, chapter 10 or chapter, uh, yeah, chapter 10. Um, verses 16, 17, the writer of Hebrews is quoting from the Old Testament saying, hey, uh, this is what, so Hebrews 10, 16 and 17 is a quotation from Jeremiah 31, 33 and 34. So the writer of Hebrews is quoting from Jeremiah saying, look, Jeremiah prophesied that God will set up a new covenant that's what he's done. So the answer to your question, Avni, Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 36, are foretelling of the coming of the new covenant, which is fulfilled in the New Testament. And Hebrews 10, 16, 17, you know, explains the fulfillment of the new covenant. Mm -hmm. Master, my question is, it says that no man more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me. Mm. So I just wanted to understand this part of this verse, 34 verse, actually. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, see, in, in the old covenant, it was the priest who knew everything. And the people didn't know. Old covenant. New covenant. God says, I will write my law into everybody's heart and mind. Right? So that's, see, like today in the new covenant, every believer can know the Lord, can know about the things of God. Not so under the old. In the old, only the priest knew. 
and uh, others would come and sit and listen to the reading of the you know of the of the scriptures new covenant god says i will give them a new heart and i will write my law in their hearts and minds so in the new there's no more saying you know you, uh, i need to teach you right? in not, not in the sense that of course god has placed teachers and all that but the, the point is in the new every believer receives the knowledge of the lord unlike the old so that's the difference he's like highlight yes thank you pastor thank you so much okay so we're going to close things here um, i hope you enjoyed this journey um, next year we're going to have a course on daniel and revelation so we will actually get into these scriptures and other passages we'll read in detail uh, and that will help us, uh, un, you know, strengthen our understanding concerning the end times. Um, uh, and uh, we will close this course today with here. Um, just look out for the assignments that I will put out and you can uh, do them. And uh, yeah, that's it. With that, we will uh, end the course. Okay. So could somebody pray with us and dismiss us, please? I know we've already taken 10 minutes extra, uh, but there's there won't be uh, the next hour. So you can have a long break okay uh could somebody close and we will dismiss okay um avni can you close please yes pastor thank you father god we are so overwhelmed by and with joy father for what we have learned about Father, the way you have taught us through Pastor Father, to prepare us for the day of your coming. And whatever we have learned, we just want to say thank you, our Father. Thank you for what you have taught us, the way you have led us. And Lord, all the blessings that we have received by receiving the truth that keeps us free, Father. Lord, let it process in us. Let it go and deep inside of us, Father, and do the work for which you have called us, Father. Produce that holiness and help us to walk in that holiness and righteousness that you desire to see in your children, Father, as you equipped us, Father, through your word. We are so thankful to you for every student who's been part of this journey, who's learned and been built up. We thank you for all the teachers who have made their efforts, Father, to teach us truth in love, Father, and as they have taught us, Father, as we begin this journey of uh, walking in your word, walking in your truth, help us each day, Father, to be led by the Spirit. And Lord, as we walk in you, Father, we may glorify you through our word, action, and deed. Let all things be done for your glory and for your glory only. We thank you once again for giving us this beautiful platform. We bless every teacher. We bless every student in the name of Jesus. And we once again thank you, Father, for this beautiful time of worship and fellowship and learning. We thank you and we ask this prayer in the precious and most matchless name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen. All right. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Um, God thank bless you, you all. Um, enjoy the rest of the day. And I'll see you again tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you. God thank bless. you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. Thank, Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you. God bless. Thank you. God bless. God bless.